In this video, I will discuss the elements of fiction, which are important to understand in a literary analysis essay, which you will be writing for essay number two. To begin with, you should think about any text you read as an equation. Each separate part has a specific meaning, and all of these separate parts tie together to form one unified whole. So think about the title, the characters, their actions, any type of descriptions, all of those parts of the short story that you're going to read all tie together, and they all have one common idea holding them together. And that idea will give you the most important meaning of the story, which is the theme. And we'll talk about that later. But it's important as you're reading to think about how all these separate parts do tie together to form one specific message or meaning to the reader. We begin with the title. The title has considerable power to attract our attention, and titles can help us understand what a novel is about, or a short story in the case of our class. Titles can be the names of central characters, they can suggest mystery, they can promise a certain kind of setting or atmosphere, they can be symbolic or metaphorical, they can be offbeat or whimsical, and they can be ironic. Think about The Sky is Gray and what this title suggests about the story. Without having read the story, what do you think it will be about just based on this title alone? Specifically think about the color gray and what emotions or associations you have with this color. Because this color is specifically mentioned in the title, we know that it's an important part of the story. We also want to consider setting, which describes the location of the story. However, setting does not just describe a place. It can also express or mirror a central character's behaviors or emotional state of mind, and it can shift to reflect changes in the plot and or in a character's mood. Settings can also shift in time, moving from past to present and to future. So you want to read in terms of looking at not just place, but any shifts in the setting, and how those shifts might affect a character and show us some change in a character. In this short example from The Sky is Gray, we note that this helps us understand a, a specific time frame in which the story occurs, and it gives us a little bit of insight about the characters themselves. So as you're reading and you find the setting, think about what the description actually has to tell you, not just about place and location, but about the characters. Next, we'll talk about plot. And plot is a sequence of events or incidents that tell the story. Importantly, all plots must have at least one type of conflict. So as you're reading the story, you want to look for conflict and identify the major conflicts that occur within the story. A conflict in literature is a clash of actions, ideas, desires, or wills. Different types of conflicts include person against person, person against the environment. This could be an external force, physical nature, society, or the concept of fate, and person against herself or himself. So a conflict with some element in a character's own nature, this could be physical, mental, emotional, or moral. Plots also illustrate artistic unity, which is essential to a good plot, which means there is nothing irrelevant that does not contribute to the total meaning of the story. So there's nothing thrown in for its own sake or for the sake of entertainment. Everything is related to that one idea that is the most important idea of the story, which is our theme. Plots have different types of story endings. In the stereotypical happy ending, 
The expectation is that the protagonist will solve all the problems, defeat the villain, and live happily ever after. However, most writers of serious fiction try to mirror real life situations. So often they will include an unhappy ending and an unhappy ending sometimes is more likely to raise significant issues concerning life and living in general. We're gonna move on to character. When we are looking at characters, we wanna consider their names. Names can be significant. They can tell us something about what type of person that character actually is. A name can be symbolic, or the absence of a name can be important too. In the sky of gray, James's father is never named. So think about why he doesn't have a name and what this says about his absence within the story and how that absence affects James and his family. A character's physical description can sometimes also reveal important information about the character by helping us determine what type of person the character actually is. And authors present characters in different ways. Firstly, in direct presentation, the author literally tells us what a character is like via a narrator, another character, or by the character herself. In indirect presentation, the author makes the reader induce for themselves what characters are like through the character's thoughts, actions, speech, looks, and interaction with other characters. These characters are also called dramatized characters, and they are generally consistent, motivated, and plausible. So they're believable, they're lifelike characters. Authors also use different character types in novels. A flat character is known by one or two traits. A round character is more complex and has many sides. A stock character is a stereotype, such as the mad scientist and the absent-minded professor. And a static character is someone who doesn't change at all from the beginning or end to the story. The dynamic characters are the most important characters in a story. So these are the characters that you specifically need to pay attention to as you're reading. A dynamic character is a developing character because they undergo some type of permanent change over the course of the story. This change must be within the possibilities of the character. It must be sufficiently motivated and there should be sufficient time for the change to occur because this should all be believable like something that could actually happen to an actual person. This takes us to the terms protagonist and antagonist. The protagonist is the central character, sympathetic or unsympathetic. So in other words, the protagonist is not necessarily a good person or that's sometimes a stereotype. The protagonist can actually be what we consider a bad person or character. The forces working against the protagonist, whether it's a person, a thing, or a convention of society, is the antagonist. So whatever force is working against the protagonist is the antagonist. And again, the antagonist does not necessarily have to be another character within the story. It could be something like a great storm or a tsunami that could, you know, as long as that, is the force that is causing a major conflict for the protagonist, that can be the antagonist. And this takes us to theme, which is the controlling idea or central insight of the story. The theme can be a revelation of human character, and it can be stated briefly or at great length. But we don't want to think about the theme as the moral of the story. A theme is not necessarily a moral can be, but not always. The theme must be expressible in the form of a statement. So rather than just saying something like war, we could say war is pointless and a curse on humanity. So we want to make a statement about the topic that's being presented in the story. A theme must also be stated as a generalization, so we don't want to include specific character names or situations, but more of a generalization. 
based on what happened with the characters. But we want to make sure that that generalization is justified by the terms of the story. So everything that happens in the story must support what we decide the theme actually is. As I mentioned, the theme is the central and unifying concept of the story, so it must adhere to the following requirements. It must account for all the major details of the story. It must not contradict any detail in the story, and it must not rely on supposed facts, which are facts that are not actually stated or clearly implied in the story. So we cannot just make up our own assumptions. Everything has to be supported directly from the story. And there is no one magical way of stating a theme. But you want to make sure that you don't make a statement that reduces a theme to some familiar saying, an aphorism, or a cliche. Some examples include a stitch in time saves nine, you can't judge a book by its cover, fish and guests smell in three days. So we don't want to say something that is so overused like you can't judge a book by its cover, that it really has no meaning anymore. We want to dig much deeper to look at all of the considerations presented to us in the story to come up with our theme. Next, we're going to discuss points of view. The way an author tells a story is called the point of view, and authors use different points of view to tell stories. First person, occurs when the author identifies with or disappears in a major or minor character, and they are all characters within the story. It's told using the first person pronoun I, and within first person, authors use different techniques of narrative. Some of these include interior monologue, which captures the train of thought, or, or sometimes this is referred to as stream of consciousness. So it's supposed to capture what thoughts are going through a character's mind. Oftentimes you can identify this through um, the lack of punctuation, and sometimes it looks like a jumble of ideas that are just presented. And then subjective narration occurs when a narrator seems unreliable and tries to get us to share their side or assume values or views that we don't share. Detached autobiography is first person narrator that is reliable and guides the reader. The narrator is the main character, often reflecting on a past self. And in a memoir or ob um, observation narration, first person, the narrator is an observer rather than a main participant in the story. The narrator can be confident, they can be an eyewitness or a chorus, which provides offstage or background information. And in this case, the narrator can be either reliable or unreliable. And second person, which we rarely see, this is the rarest mode uh, used in literature. The narrator refers to one of, the, one of the characters as you, which creates the feeling that the reader is a character within the story. This is most often combined with the first person mode, where the narrator makes an emotional comparison between the thoughts, actions, and feelings of you versus I, and the narrator can be a character within the story. Third person is the most commonly used point of view in literature. Each and every character is referred to by the narrator as he, she, it, or they. The narrator is not a character and the narrator is an unspecified entity or uninvolved person that conveys the story. We also have alternating person, which many literary, literary texts use. So this is where the author alternates between first and third person. So the author moves back and forth between a more omniscient third person narrator to a more personal first person narrator. Another type of narration is the epistolary narrative voice, which uses a series of letters or other documents to convey the plot of the story. They can be characters, 
within the story, and they can be considered multi-person narratives. They can also be classified separately since they have no narrator. Instead, they have an author who gathered the documents together into one place. And then by reading those letters, we are exposed to the different characters. I have a separate video that discusses some of the common types of figurative language in literature, but just to touch on some of the most common types of figurative language in this video, I did include symbol, metaphor, and irony. So a symbol in literature has a variety of meanings. It has layers of meanings, whereas an image only has one meaning. To help identify if something is a symbol or if it's symbolic, we can think about names used as symbols, the use of objects as symbols, and the use of actions as symbols. We have to keep in mind that the story itself must furnish a clue that a detail is to be taken symbolically. And symbols almost always signal their existence by emphasis, repetition, or position. And again, the meaning of a literary symbol must be established and supported by the entire context of the story. So just because we might think, for example, that a rose is symbolic and signals love, we have to look at how that symbol or that thing or object is used within the story to decide if it really is in fact symbolic or not. It could just be a rose. So again, to be called a symbol, an item must suggest a meaning different in kind from its literal meaning. So a symbol has a cluster of meanings. A metaphor attempts to represent one thing more effectively by comparing it to another. So we compare two unlike things in a metaphor. Sometimes metaphors are extended throughout an entire story, and that is called an extended metaphor. And then irony is a term with a range of meanings, and all of them involve some sort of discrepancy or incongruity. There are three types of irony in literature. Verbal irony, which is saying the opposite of what you mean. Situational irony, which is when something other than what is expected to happen happens. And dramatic irony, which is the contrast between what a character says and what a character or the reader actually knows to be true. This concludes this video. Again, I do have more information about figurative language in a separate video. If you have any questions about anything that I covered in this long video, please let me know. Thank you.